see that? My wife loves me. She just took my chewed gum. <laughs> Happy eighth anniversary today, by the way. I love you. And you all should applaud me for having to put up with her. Um, we're in our second week of our series called Living Your Best Life. We're studying Psalm chapter 23, uh, fitting with the song that we just sang. Um, last week, we opened up the series, and uh, we just focused on the first verse in Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And we talked about the fact that if God is your shepherd, he leads you, he provides he brings you to a place of contentment, not that he gives you everything that your evil heart desires, but he brings you to a place of contentment and a place that no matter where you are, you can kind of say, it is well with my soul. And we said that the key to the whole thing was the, uh, let's see, fourth word in the first phrase, the Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd, it's a personal thing. And if it's not personal to you, then Psalm 23 is just awesome poetry, okay? It's gotta be personal. It's gotta be a personal vertical thing between you and the Lord. And so we're gonna continue right on down Psalm chapter 23 uh, today. And uh, the title of the sermon today is He Restores My Soul. So open your Bible to Psalm 23. And I think I want to do kind of what we did last week, if you all don't care. Now, our main text for this morning is just going to be verse 2 and the first four words of verse 3. But what I want to do before we get into that is I want to, uh, to recite the whole psalm, okay? We did that last week, and I think it's good to, to memorize Scripture. I think it's good for us to recite God's Word together. Y'all game for that? Okay, everybody at Psalm 23. All right, recite it along with me. Psalm 23 starts with, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Good, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. As always, I just ask, Father, that you would just teach us from your word, encourage us from your word, challenge us from your word, change us, God. We want to be receptive this morning. We don't just want to be here playing church. And so I would ask, Lord, that you, Holy Spirit, would come and just open our hearts and minds and our ears to your word, Father, and that your truth may fall on us and that we may apply your truth and it change our lives, Lord, all for your glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, just two points today. Two points. They'll take a minute. We got several lists to go through this morning as well. I just try to want to help you guys as we get through this. So here's the first point. What my shepherd does. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Well, what's my shepherd do? Here's the answer. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. Now let's, let's talk about the word restores for a second. I think we like the idea of restoration, don't we? Well, maybe not. I'll go to the next church and preach. So, so uh, you know, a, a, an old car. Anybody, anybody in here restore old cars? Well, good. We like them, but we don't restore them. That's good. But, but we've seen an old car beat up, and, and somebody has seen the value in that car and said, I could take that and work some things and, and, and get some things done there and make it look like it used to, right? Think about houses. 
People restore houses. I know we have some people in here that restore old furniture. I've seen it. And we've got some talented people in our congregation when it comes to old furniture and restoring old furniture. Well, it's kind of the same idea and the same concept here. When the word says, he restores my soul, the Hebrew word translated restores is yeshavev, yeshavev. It's uh, used 1,048 times in the Old Testament. And here's the definition, to replenish. To return back to a point previously departed from. Here's my favorite definition. To return to the original state. To return to the original state. Think, um, think laundry. I've got an aunt and seriously, every time she eats, you just look right here, there's food right here. Every time. It don't matter is it, if it's spaghetti, if it's, uh, you know, soup, it, if it's a sandwich, there's mayonnaise, right? I mean, there's always something right here. And it always leads to a stain. And so when I think restore, when I think bring back to a place of an original state, I think laundry. Stained clothes and you take it to the launderer or you do your own laundry and then it comes out restored. Restored. Now, last week, we just talked for just a second about the fact that our God is a provider. So this morning, I just want to talk for just a second about the fact that our God is a restorer. Our God is in the restoration business. You don't believe me? Jeremiah 30, 17, God says, I will restore to you health. Job 42, 10, it says, the Lord restored Job's fortunes. We worship a God who restores. He brings things back to the original state. He restores. Now notice here, this is not a physical restoration. He restores my what? Soul. Yeah. He restores my soul. Now let's talk about that for just a second. Nefesh is the Hebrew word translated soul. And it means soul or life or heart or mind or breath. It's used 728 times in the Old Testament. In Genesis 2-7, it said, God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed in him, and he became a nefesh, a living being, a soul. Now, when we say soul, what we're referring to is, is the immaterial part of a person, Okay. It's, the immater- it's not the physical part, it's the immaterial part of a person that lives on beyond this physical life. Okay, do you ever get the sense to you that, hey, I- I'm more than just this body. Like there's more to me than just this skin and these bones and this muscle and this fat. And, and <laughs> there's just more to me than the physical part. Well, that's right, the soul Listen, the soul is the real you, okay? You are not your body. You are not your skin. You are not your muscle or fat, thank God. The soul is the real you. I've quoted C.S. Lewis before, and I'm going to do it again. C.S. Lewis says, you have a body, but you are a soul. You say, well, what, what, what exactly is the soul? The soul consists of three parts. It consists of your mind, your emotions, and your will, okay? That's really your personality. Your mind, emotions, and will. That's your soul. That's actually how we're made in the image of God. When you read that in Genesis and people say, we're made in God's image, a lot of people think, oh, that means we look like God. No, 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 no. God is a spirit, The second person of the Trinity came to the earth and took on a physical body, but God is not physical. God is a spirit. And so the way we are made in his image is not in how we look, how we're made. We're made in his image because, well, in Genesis it says God thinks, which means God has a mind, that God feels, which means he has emotions, and that God does, which means he has a will. That's how we're made in the image of God. That's our soul. Mind, will, emotions. 
And the soul is the part of me that needs to be restored. He restores my soul. The inner me. God replenishes the inner me. Two observations. Number one, your soul can get depleted. Did you know that? Have you ever felt drained on the inside? I mean, thoughts come in your head and nag you and, 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 and you get uh, burnt out and stress kind of grinds at us and you have no, you ever got to the end of the day and just felt like you're just done and it's not so much physically that you're done, you're just kind of like the inner me is just kind of, you ever felt like that? Every day. Good. The soul can be depleted. Let me read you Jeremiah 31, 25. God speaking here says, For I will satisfy the weary soul, and every languishing soul I will replenish. So it's quite possible for our souls to be weary and languishing or depleted. You felt like you've had the energy just sucked out of you. I wonder how many people are here this morning that have a soul that's depleted and in desperate, desperate need of being restored. Let me give you quickly seven things that uh, deplete our souls. Seven things that deplete our souls. Number one, people. Even good people, your friends, your buddies, fun people that you go out and have fun with, you crack jokes with, you watch football with, you go shopping with, people can drain your soul. Too much public time, not enough private time. Good people can, listen, if good people can drain you, how about them needy people in your life? Ugh, ugh. Draining people, that they always need your attention, I need your help. You ever had a conversation with somebody and they walk away and you feel like they've sucked the life right out of you? If you haven't, maybe you're that person. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, but, but people can drain us. Too much relational exposure, not enough private time. People drain us, number one. Number two, problems deplete our souls, right? Health concerns, uh, financial strain, conflict with others, even little things deplete our souls. Well, Junior's sick, and i got to take off work and uh, take him to the doctor, or I wonder how much PTO I have at work, and, 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 and the belt slipped off in my car, and i got to take it to the mechanic. Just little things can deplete us as well. People, problems. Here's the third thing, problem for all of us in this room, busyness. Busyness can deplete our souls. Well, I've got a dentist appointment at 3 o'clock on uh, Monday, and Junior's got a game Tuesday evening at 7, and I've got to get coffee with my friend Friday morning at 8.30, and Peggy Sue has a recital Thursday at 7.30, and I've got church Wednesday, and I've got this going on, and it's, it's, it's running from one thing to another constantly. Too many things to do. Not enough downtime. Constantly like a ping pong ball. Bing, 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 bing. Back and forth off of everything. We're busy. Busyness drains our soul. It depletes our soul. Here's the fourth thing. People pleasing depletes our souls. You say, well, what are you talking about? This is, a, uh, this is kind of a personality type. There's some people in here who are people pleasers, man. I, I mean, constantly trying to meet the expectations of others so that other people think good of me. People pleasers live by shoulds and oughts. Well, they invited our uh, son to, to a birthday party and, and we should go because they invited us. Well, our son doesn't even play with him. But it doesn't matter. He's in the same third grade class and they invited us. We ought to go. Why? Well, because we just should. We don't want to be rude, and, and, and I have to do this, and so-and-so asked if I could do that. Not enough no's. Can't tell anybody no because you're worried about pleasing everybody. 
Man, that's so depleting. People, problems, busyness, people pleasing. Here's a fifth one, big time, listen up, that depletes us. Social media. Social media. I'm on my phone and, and, and I'm, I'm looking and my brain is constantly on and it's constantly analyzing and, 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 and oh, look at her new cat and look at what he ate for dinner and look at their new car and oh my gosh. And, my br- and like I had somebody ask me the other day, do you think you can develop like ADD as an adult? And I was like, no, I think it's because of that phone you're on. Your attention span is about seven seconds long because you look at this post and on to the next, and then on to the next, then on to the next. It's draining. You're not getting to a good place checking out Facebook all the time. You're comparing. You're looking at a figment, a character of somebody on Facebook or on Snapchat or on Instagram. Social media is draining. We are the nosiest people in the world, for real. Like, it's one thing to care about somebody's needs. Oh, but I wonder what he's going to, what are they going to name their baby? It's like, well, how, look, look at their yard. I bet they cut that yard three inches tall. Like, Who cares? You know, we're so nosy. Worried about other people too much and not about our own souls. Here's another thing that will uh, deplete our souls, the pursuit of perfection. This is a word for the perfectionists in the room. Uh, We are not perfect people, and we do not live in a perfect world. And if you try to make everything in your life perfect, it will drive you nuts. Well, I need to leave the house at 1013, and it's 1012. Where are the kids? Where are the kids? We've got to do this. And not a speck of dust on the picture frames at the house. And every T crossed, every I dotted, everything's got to be perfect, perfect, perfect. That's so draining. <laughs> so draining. People, problems, busyness, people pleasing, social media, the pursuit of perfection. Here's the last one that I've got down here that depletes our souls. Coveting. Covet, I want, I want, I want a job. Oh, now I've got a job, I want a better job. I I want a spouse, okay, I've got a spouse, now I want kids, okay, now I've got two girls, now I want a boy. Uh, Oh, more, 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 I want a new boat, I want a new house, I want a nicer car, I want this, I want that, I want, I want, I want. It depletes our souls. Coveting, coveting. He restores my soul. And what's sad is we're consumed with what depletes our souls. Think about that list real quick again. People, problems, busyness, people pleasing, social media, the pursuit of perfection, and coveting. We are consumed with those things. And then we walk around and we wonder why I always feel so down and like my energy is just zapped and I'm drained. It's because your soul's depleted. There's one step further from your soul being depleted. Your soul can be cast down. Your soul can be cast down. So if depleted is more about feeling tired on the inside and burn out and ran down and I need some more of something going on in my life, being cast down is kind of a step downward. It's more of now I'm kind of in depression. I'm kind of uh, have some despair going on. Listen biblically from Psalm 42, what David says. Psalm 42, 5 and 6, David says, why my soul? He didn't say why my body. Why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Verse 6, my soul is downcast within me. Verse 11, it, 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 it just repeats verse 5 there. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? So the first step is soul depletion, and now we're at your soul being cast down. And it's funny because last week we talked a lot about sheep, right? The Lord is my shepherd. We said we are sheep. 
You say, well, that's an interesting way to put it, Kev. Your soul can get cast down. Why do you say cast down? Well, what you've got to understand is cast down is shepherd talk. David was a shepherd, right? This whole psalm is about the Lord being my shepherd and I am a sheep. So when you see the words cast down, we've got to understand what it is. They use this term when talking about a sheep. A sheep could get cast down. They called it a cast sheep. And let me tell you what would happen. A sheep would lay down to relax, and it would lay on its side, and it would keep uh, two of its limbs, depending on which way it was laying, would keep them on the ground. But when the sheep would lay down and rest, if it ever rolled over too far, it could actually roll over on its back, and all four of its limbs would be up in the air. And they called that a cast sheep. And what you need to understand is, is that when that sheep got cast, it couldn't get up and it would panic and it would flail its little legs and it would struggle and it would cry but it couldn't get up it was cast and you say well what's the big deal with that well the big deal is this once it got turned over on its back these gases would get trapped inside of its stomach and the gases would build up and not be able to get out, and it would cut off the circulation to the extremities of the sheep. Before you know it, the stomach would actually harden, and it would cut off the airway of the sheep, and it would suffocate and die. So on a hot day, within two to three hours, a cast sheep could be dead. That's why it was always so important for shepherds to be counting their sheep. Oh, I'm missing one. I hope it's not cast down somewhere. And they would always go look. And what they would do is you'd have to pick the sheep up and put it on its legs, but you couldn't just let it go and run or it'd fall over again. They'd have to pick the sheep up and kind of massage the legs and get the feeling back into the extremities, get the circulation back, and then let the sheep kind of gain its equilibrium and then kind of get on its feet and go forward. That's the picture of a cast down sheep. But listen, our souls get cast down. Our souls get troubled and really, really heavy. And we kind of, you know, get feelings that knock us down. And then we struggle to get back on our feet. This is a step further than your soul being depleted. Cast sheep were really, really, really easy targets for predators. I mean, think about it if you're a wolf. You see this poor little sheep laying on its back. Can't get here. You're like, oh, yeah, it must be Christmas time, baby. Easy lunch, right? Well, in the same way, we're easy targets for our predators, for our enemy, when our souls are cast down. And let me say this. You say, but the Lord is my shepherd. Yeah, well, the Lord was David's shepherd, and David said, Why, my soul, are you cast down? So even under the care of the good shepherd, our souls can be depleted and cast down. So we're kind of familiar with a physical checkup, right? You go to your doctor once a year, or if you're a man, once every seven years, and get a, or until your wife nags you enough to go. You go to the doctor, and you get a physical checkup. We're pretty familiar with that. But uh, let's get a soul checkup real quick. Let's get a soul checkup real quick. Because I don't want you to leave here today confused. Ten things right here. I know my soul needs to be restored when... Here comes ten things. I know I need my soul restored when, number one, I'm not practicing spiritual disciplines. I can't find my Bible, I haven't had it open in a while, I'm not praying, or if I am, it's about nothing specific, it's just kind of in general, blah, 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 I'm not praising, I'm not worshiping, I'm not, it's just kind of blasé. Okay, you need your soul restored. I know I need my soul restored when, number two, I'm burnt out on things I love. Oh, I, I love coaching juniors baseball team but I'm just I just can't I'm, I'm just kind of over I'm gonna have to take a couple of weeks off from doing that because I, I got too much on my plate I, I can't handle this or I, I love coming to church and participating but I just I, I just can't do it right now I just I'm burnt out okay your soul needs to be restored number three I know my 
I know I need my soul restored when I'm having reoccurring relational problems. I mean, me, me and my husband, we just fight. We just fight every day about the stupidest little stuff. I mean, you know, and he goes off on me. You know, where are you at with that? Do little things set you off? I can't believe you put onions in the meatloaf. Like, okay, psycho, is it that big of a deal? <laughs> you know? Reoccurring relational problems where little things set you off, your soul needs to be restored. Number four, I know I need my soul restored when I'm negative. I'm negative. Everything that comes through this mouth, out these two lips here, negative. Yeah, that food's terrible. I don't like that. Why do y'all do that this way here? Why are these lots blue, by the way? They don't look great. They'd be better if they were green. And, and, and where's our drummer at this morning? And that song would have sounded better if we had a drummer up here. Why are we playing this little whatever you call it? You, I mean, <laughs> you know, negative. Everything's negative. If there's 10 things going on in your life and nine of them are positive, you focus on the negative. Everything's negative. I don't like that. We shouldn't go here. You shouldn't say that. You should wear this kind of clothes. I don't like this. I don't like that. I I'm not happy. Okay, well, your soul needs to be restored. What you need to understand is there's soul health when there's joy, despite your circumstances. Remember? If you're up and down based on your circumstances, that's happiness. We're not talking about happiness. We're talking about joy given from the Lord. When your soul's healthy, there's joy. Not always negativity. Number five, I know I need my soul restored when I'm discontent. Nothing pleases me. Nothing pleases me. I'm not content with everything, anything, man. You know, I got a three-bedroom house. I need a four-bedroom house. Why? It's just you and your wife. Doesn't matter. I just need a bigger house. I need a newer car. Dude, you've got a 2016 such and such. It doesn't matter. I need a newer one. You know what, I, I don't like what's going on here. I, it needs to be something else. I, always searching, always looking, kind of what we talked about last week if you were here, the, the fence crawlers. Always looking for the greener grass, no matter how good you've got it where you are. You're discontent. You know your soul's healthy when there's contentment in your life, regardless of your circumstances. Number six, I know I need my soul restored when I'm overcome with anxiety, worry, or fear. When that's all that's on my mind, if it's just, I'm a, I'm a walking ball of anxiety. All I do is, is walk around and just worry all the time. I just, just see these fearful things in the future that perhaps could happen, and that's all I focus on. Then you need your soul restored. There's, the, the Lord's called the Prince of Peace. Yeah, yeah when your soul's healthy, there's peace there. Not walking around in, in frantic all the time. And you're looking at number one right here. I mean, this is one thing I struggle with. And I've told people before, you know when pastor is walking in the spirit when there's peace. If you stop by here this Tuesday and I'm like, yeah, the flu's starting to go around. Now I'm like really worried about my daughter's getting sick. You can be like, yeah, yeah dude, you need your soul restored. You're walking in the flesh. I know I need my soul restored when... Here's number seven. I'm having physical problems. I'm having physical problems because of the stress in my life. I, I, I have headaches every day and I have stomach issues or GI issues. I have high blood pressure. Um, I'm, I'm having ulcers going on in my life. Okay, well, well maybe, maybe it's not so much physical. Maybe it's an, something's going on with your soul and you need it restored. Number eight, I know I need my soul restored when I can't get to sleep and I can't get up. I, I can't turn off the day when I lay down in bed. I just lay there and I lay there for two or three hours and just talking about sheep. I try to count sheep. Doesn't work. I can't go to sleep and I can't get up. So I'm scared to turn off the day and then I'm scared to start a new one. Too much going on. Number nine, I know I need my soul restored when I can't tell people no. Hey, Kev, can you cook some chili for the chili cook-off? Yeah. Can you be a taster for it? Yeah. Hey, can you meet them here? Yeah. Can you do this? Yeah. Can you go to their game? Yeah. Can you counsel them? Yeah. Can you do? Yeah. yeah. Too many yeses, 
not enough no's. Do you know that Jesus told people no? He left crowds standing beside the Sea of Galilee to go get alone with his father at times. And if Jesus needed that, why do we think we don't? Last one, kind of in general here. I know I need my soul restored when my plate is too full and my heart is too empty. He restores my soul when my soul is depleted or downcast. That's the fact. That's the conclusion. That's what my shepherd does. Now let's take just a minute and look at how he does it. This is the second point. How he does it. Now we're back in verse 2. He restores our souls with two, two different ways. Number one, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Now let me, let me say this. I'm Kevin. I'm the pastor here. I've had people go, oh, you're the pastor at Harvest Point. They're like, no, no, no. I'm the pastor, not the pasture. <laughs> All right? Just to clear that up. Now, in your sermon notes, I have, I have a parenthesis there uh, that, that's blank. And here's what I want you to put in it. Crisis. C-R-I-S-I-S. Here's how he restores my soul. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now we're talking about a crisis. Now, green pastures in the Hebrew is the, the tender, new, nutrient-rich grass. This is the best grass for the sheep to be around and to eat on. This kind of young, it's like, it's not mature grass, not ready to be mowed yet. It's new, tender grass. And green pastures really represent the best place for the sheep. And it's the same with us. He makes me lie down in a place that's best for me at that time. God wants our best and he wants to restore our souls but that only comes when we're at the best place where he wants us to be. Notice he makes me lie down in green pastures. It, it doesn't say he makes me run around in green pastures. It doesn't say he makes me pace back and forth in green pastures. He makes me lie down. I've been studying sheep a lot lately. And I'm about to become a shepherd, I <laughs> think. But apparently, sheep won't lie down unless their belly's full and they're totally confident. If there's any kind of fear in a sheep, it will not lay down. This is signifying confidence, safety, satisfaction, joy comes with this. God will make me confident in him. He will make me satisfied in him he will make me joyful in him as I'm laying down in the green pasture. Now, the green pasture is wherever is the best place for me at that time. The crazy thing is, as I was looking at this, was the second word in verse 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm lying down in green pastures, but he makes me lie down in green pastures. And so I've got the New King James here. I usually preach out of the NIV, but the New King James says, he makes me. The NIV says, he makes me. The King James says, he makes me. What do you got there? Makes. Huh? Makes me. makes me. Makes me. Everybody's got their Bibles open. I love to see people's Bibles open in church. Every translation says, he makes me lie down. Listen to me. Sometimes... God has to make us lie down. And he's more than capable of making you lie down. It's a picture here. It's a picture of a shepherd and a runaway sheep. Okay, what would happen sometimes is a shepherd would have a sheep and it'd run off. He'd count a sheep. Oh, I'm missing one. He would go get the sheep and bring it back. And it may run off again and he would go bring it get it and bring it back. 
If this kept occurring, the shepherd would take the sheep in his arm and he would crack the leg of the sheep over his knee and make it lie down. Now, he would doctor the sheep. He would put a splint on it. And I found out that once the sheep had fully healed, it would never leave the side of the shepherd anymore. And sometimes... Because God wants be- what's best for us, he will make us lie down. He loves you. He loves you. And listen, if you continue to neglect your soul, the day's coming when he will make you lie down. You can't neglect your soul forever without a major collapse coming in your life, without a major crisis coming. And maybe God's got you in a place like that right now. You need your soul restored. It's depleted. It's cast down. And he's wounded you in order to restore you. You're in a crisis. Listen, maybe your green pasture is in a hospital bed. Maybe your green pasture is in your boss's office and him sitting there with a pink slip in his hand. Maybe your green pasture is at a funeral of a loved one or in the midst of some kind of painful relationship and God has made you lie down. You say, well, well, that doesn't seem too green to me. It's supposed to be green pastures. Well, listen, maybe it looks brown to you, but maybe it's green from God's perspective because of the good it's going to produce in your life. God restores our souls The first way he does it is through crisis. He makes us lie down. He brings a stop or a pause into our lives that makes us lie down. The second way God restores our souls is he leads me beside still waters. In your parentheses, in your sermon notes, write process. So one way he restores our souls is through crisis. Another way he will restore our souls is through process. We're talking about the everyday, day-to-day process. He leads me beside still waters. Now, rushing waters scare sheep. They just just do. Sheep will not drink from a fast-flowing stream. They'll scatter. They run. Sheep are really frigidy or fidgety. I think I made a word up there. (laughs) They're not cold, okay? They're fidgety. They frighten easy. Oh, like us. Like us. Sheep won't hang around running water. He leads me beside still waters. Still waters represent here peace, quiet, calmness, relaxation, where you can receive constant refreshment and restoration from the Lord. Still waters are deep, right? Okay, listen. Jesus leads us to places of depth that bring us quietness and peace to our souls. The day-to-day process. He does that. He leads me beside still water. That's a gentle leading. What are you doing over there trying to get refreshed? Come over here where there's depth and and there's peace and your soul can be restored. See, he's leading us. He leads us beside still waters. He doesn't lead us into still waters and then back up out of them. It's a constant leading beside along the way of still waters. This is where I live my life, man. This is a daily thing is what David's saying here. It's just walking with Jesus continually, day by day, habitually as a pattern of life beside still waters. This is the place where God continuously restores our souls. We're going to end with this. Let me give you uh, seven things that God uses to restore our souls in process. Remember, an everyday process is what we're talking about. Number one, he uses his word. He uses his word to restore our souls. Psalm 19, 7 says, the law of the Lord. This is the law of the Lord. 
This is his word. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. You said, yeah, I thought we were talking about restoring the soul. This is refreshing. Guess what? Same Hebrew word. Same Hebrew word. He uses his word because it renews our minds. His word encourages us and restores us. And let me say, being in his word for soul restoration takes time, okay? It's not, hey, uh, one quick scripture over coffee, now I'm out the door to, to work. Like, I'm not against, I'm not against, I'm not against, listen, hear me, I'm not against daily devotionals. But you need to go deeper than just reading a little Max Lucado thing. And I'm not bashing it. It's, it's good. It's fine. It's great. But you need to go deeper. You need to read God's Word for yourself. Don't let somebody else chew it up and digest it for you and spit it back out. You read God's Word. You see what God has to say for you that day. That's what restores our souls. Time in the Word. Here's the second thing he uses. Prayer. Prayer. Intimacy with our shepherd where we can give him our cares. Right? Remember, when you're, when you're full of anxiety and worry and fear, you need your soul restored. Prayer is a place to do that. What's Philippians 4, 6, and 7 say? Don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious. Okay, well, if I'm, on, if I'm not anxious, what do you want me to do? Do this. In every situation... By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Here's some truth for you. If you're high in anxiety, I can promise you you're low in prayer. I don't have to talk to you. I don't have to gauge. I I can just, if you're high in anxiety, if you're high in worry, if you're high in fear at a moment in time, it means you haven't been praying much. Now you can reverse that. You restore your soul in prayer. That's what Paul says in verse 7. Don't be anxious, pray. Well, what happens when I pray? Verse 7, the peace of God, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Your heart and your mind, that's part of your soul, right? Oh, yeah, because prayer restores our soul. Jesus uses his word. He uses prayer. Thirdly, he uses praise to restore our souls. A few minutes ago, we read in Psalm 42, 5 and 6, where David says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Then look what he says. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. My soul's downcast. My soul's depleted. So what what do I need to do? Get some praise going on. How about that? Sing. Sing. It amazes me that we meet here on church on Sunday morning, and the whole purpose to meet here is to worship God, and people stand here while, while we're praising and singing our faces off up here, and people stand here and go, I'm like, why did you come? We're here to worship. Praise is part of worship. So I don't feel like it, man. My soul's downcast. All right, then that's exactly what you need to do is to praise. Number four. God uses remembering to restore our souls. If you stay right where we're at in Psalm 42, not verse 5, but verse 6, he says, My soul's downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. Speaking to the Lord. I will remember you. My soul's downcast, so what am I going to do? I'm not going to think about all the bad things going on in my soul. I'm going to remember God. I'm going to remember his character. I'm going to remember his faithfulness. I'm going to remember his promises. I'm going to remember his goodness. I'm going to remember his love. I'm going to remember his faithfulness. Fix your mind on that. Those are four kind of spiritual things Jesus uses to restore our souls, his word, prayer, praise, and remembering. Here's three really, really practical everyday things he uses for us as we close. He uses sleep. Sleep restores our souls. Now, now, not in church. (laughs) Don't sleep in church. Sleep restores our souls. You know the average adult needs like seven to nine hours of sleep? Apparently, through my shallow research this week, 
the average American gets around five to six hours a night. I don't need it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever. Sleep restores our soul. Number six, rest. Rest. Sit quietly. But I got to check Snapchat. No, 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 no. Sit quietly. Move slowly. Go nowhere. Here's a hard one for you do nothing. Move slow, sit quietly, go nowhere, do nothing. That's rest. Now listen, you got to sleep, then rest. Because some of us in here try to rest, but we always fall asleep while we're trying to rest, right? It's because it's two different things. You can't rest until you get enough sleep. Sleep restores our souls. Rest restores our souls. Lastly, leisure activities restore our souls. Man, something different than the everyday hustle and bustle. Something more than just my everyday burdens and responsibilities. I don't know what that looks like for you all. Watch a baseball game if that's what it is. Hang out with your family. Go out in the yard with your kids and play. Like, here's something I don't think our kids know nowadays. Me and Ruben talk about a lot. It's fun to play outside. My kids like the phone. Okay, get it out of their hand and get them outside. Let them play in the dirt, man. Run around with them in the grass. Let them live a little bit. Spend time with your family. Watch TV. Read a book. Go for a walk. Exercise. All these leisure activities actually restore our souls because we're getting away from the everyday grit and grind. So there it is. That's what my shepherd does. He restores my soul. Here's how he does it. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. So here's your sum up. We've been all about living your best life, right? That's the, that's the tagline of our series. Everybody wants to live their best life. Well, check this out. Living your best life involves having a vibrant soul full of confidence, peace, and joy. The good shepherd restores the souls of his sheep through crisis and process. Here's the, here's the invitation today. Some of you don't know the good shepherd, okay? Let me just throw that out there. Some of you, all, he's, you're not his sheep, okay? So, so everything we've talked about here is available to you if you become his sheep. Outside, outside of the faith, if you're not of the Christian faith, if you've not trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you're not a Christian. But I'm white. Cool. But I go to church. Cool. But I carry a Bible. Cool. You're not a Christian. If you're not trusting in Jesus' death for the forgiveness of your sins and that he rose again on the third day, that's the gospel. If you're not trusting in that, you're not a sheep. So some of you all need to become a sheep this morning. For those of us in this room that are his sheep, some of us need to take the steps we just talked about. Being in his word, prayer, praise, remembering, sleep, rest, leisure, activities. You've already got one down. We've just been in the word. In a minute, this altar is going to be open, and you can knock out the second thing. Get down here and pray. Some of you are downcast. Some of you came in here today, and your soul is on E. Get down here to this altar in just a minute and cry out to your shepherd like David did. My soul's downcast. I'm eating up with anxiety. I'm burnt out. I'm negative. I need to be restored. We've been in the Word. Come down here and pray. Then go back to your seat and praise. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that. And then throughout this week, remember. Remember God. Remember who He is and what He's done. Get some sleep this week. Rest this week. Put the phone down and rest. And have some leisure time so that your soul can be restored. Now, now, usually I don't do this. But we're doing something a little different this morning. So here's what I want everybody to do. Please, everybody, please close your eyes, bow your head. Okay? There, you don't need to be looking around. There's nothing up here that you need to see. Here's what I want to propose to you. 
the soul restoration challenge, okay? That's what I'm proposing to you. Here's what it consists of. Before you come back to this building next Sunday morning, if you want your soul restored, here's the challenge. Before you come back, spend 45 minutes alone with the Lord three times this week. On three separate days, take your Bible, take some music, be ready to pray, and spend 45 minutes with the Lord. Don't check on the kids, don't watch TV, don't check your email, don't check Facebook, everything off, just you and the Lord three times this week. Just three days this week. I'm not asking you to do it every day because I, I don't want to discourage you. If you miss it, you may just give up. But three days this week, spend 45 minutes with the Lord. Choose a time, choose a place, choose a passage of Scripture, read it, then pray, and praise. We don't want to be hearers of the Word only. We want to be doers of the Word. So, everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. That's the soul restoration challenge that's going on this week. If you're willing to accept the challenge, I'm going to ask you right now to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed and just stand up. If you say, I'll do it, just stand up. Good. Good. Now I'm going to pray for us. And if you need to get down here to this altar because your soul's depleted, because you're downcast, come on down here. Lord, we love you. God, we always thank you for your word. And not only are you our good shepherd who guides us and provides for us, God, but, but we all get down at times. We all feel like we're burnt out. Our souls just get depleted, Lord. Sometimes our souls are downcast, God. And you, our good shepherd, gladly restore our souls. And we praise you for that, God. I praise you for that in my life personally, Lord. When you've restored my soul, when you've quickened in me the energy back to life, the zeal to live, the passion, Lord, I thank you for that. I know there are people here hurting this morning. I know there are people here whose souls are downcast or depleted, Lord, and I just ask that you deal with them right now, Father. You are our good shepherd, and we thank you again for restoring our souls. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.